Good morning. What an incredible time for us to gather together to worship the Lord. And uh, I, I just am amazed at how God puts things together as I'm listening to every worship song today, uh, to the, the choir song. Uh, as we start a new series today, a sermon series on worship, the title of the message is Made to Worship, and the series is More Than a Song, More Than a Song. I don't know if some of you are uh, familiar with worship music, but a song that we have sung in the past, Matt Redman authored a song that came out in the 1990s called The Heart of Worship, and the lyrics of that song say, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you've required. You search much deeper within. You're looking into my heart. And the response is, I'm coming back to a heart of worship because it's all about you, Jesus. I think that just kind of sets the stage uh, for where, where we're going, what we want to talk about, especially today and in the coming weeks. There was another song that came out probably a decade ago by an author named Jimmy Needham, uh, called Clear the Stage, and a lot of lyrics of that song, but the chorus of that just basically says that you can sing all you want to, and you can still get it wrong, because worship is more than a song. And so that's the title of the series as we are moving forward, More Than a Song. And that's not to diminish singing praises to the Lord. It's that, but it's so much more. Listen to what the scripture says, Psalm 100. Man, too soon, right? Psalm 100 says this, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So the scripture encourages us to do just that. Psalm 95, 6, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Psalm 150, uh, verse 6, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. That's what we are called to do. First Chronicles 16, 29 says, Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his presence. Worship the Lord in his holy splendor. Listen, what we can glean from all these verses is that we were made to worship. We were made to worship. But our worship is so much more than a song. With worship being more than a song, it says to me that we need to be participants, not simply observers. Truth this morning from your heart, when you came in and you've gone through this much of the service where there's a lot of singing and a lot of music, how many of you would say more than being a participant today, you are kind of more of an observer up to this point in the service? Just don't have to raise your hand. But I think it's calling us to be participants and not just simply observers. We need to be contributors, not just consumers. We need to be ready to engage with our hearts and not just watch with our eyes. I think too often, that's why I sit at the front. Because if I sit in the back, guess what I'm doing? I'm watching what all the rest of y'all are doing. And I know you're better than me. You don't ever do that. You're focused from the downbeat of the song. We come to worship, and that's what I'm doing. I sit at the front. Listen, obviously, nobody else got, not many people got the memo. My Wednesday class, this is what happens. Nobody sits in the first three rows, right in the front section. Like they all sit on the sides and in the back. I have to pay them to sit closer. <laughs> Our tendency is, to, is to, to do, but no matter where you sit in the sanctuary, Listen, we're not to be observers. We're to be participants, contributors, not just consumers. I love good music. I'm thankful that we have talented musicians. I love the songs that we sing. I love doing this all together with friends and family. It's a good thing for us to come together, to worship together. But when those things become the focus, rather than Jesus, then we lose the heart of worship. It's all about him. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, he told the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, 
So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship is more than the externals. There's a lot of those things. It's not about any of those things. It's about a heart, our heart and our heads, worshiping him in spirit and in truth. What does the Bible say is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Is that worship? There's probably not a verse in the, in the Bible that speaks worship more than that one right there. The greatest thing that we can do, the second greatest thing is to love our neighbor as, as ourselves. But the greatest commandment, the number one, the top of the list, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema. It's the, it's the purpose. It's, it's why we live. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then, he, and then he goes into saying that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Paul wrote to the, the Romans probably the greatest uh, definition for us. And that is this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him, by offering our lives to him and loving him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and our strength. Two things that I notice from Romans chapter 12, verse 1, is that God takes the initiative. He takes the initiative. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. He's done the first thing. God makes the first move, and he never asks us to do the first thing. He always does the first thing. I want you to think about it. He created us. He saved us. He forgives us. He blesses us. He protects us. And because of all those things and so many others, we ought to worship him. So our response, we should respond to all that he's done. He takes the initiative, and then we respond to what he's done. Paul's saying, give your lives to God. Offer your bodies to him as a sacrifice of worship. We respond by giving back to him. He gives to us, we give back to him, and that is worship. That's worship. What do we have to offer God? We just came through Christmas season. Some of you travail on finding the right gift for someone. Some of you go, I don't know, I just went and found something at the store. Some of you are going, I don't even care about giving gifts. I don't care if I get gifts. But here's the thing, what do, you, what do you give someone who has absolutely everything? What do we give to God, the one who has everything, who owns everything, who made the world, who created the universe, who made our very lives? What do we give to him? We give him our love. Love the Lord your God. You must love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. He wants us to love him passionately with our heart and our soul. He wants us to love him thoughtfully with all of our mind. He wants us to love him practically with our strength, with our abilities, the abilities that he's given to us. He created everything. He owns everything. But there are three things that he doesn't have unless we give that to, the, to him. And the first is our affection. He doesn't have our affection unless we give it to him. That's loving God with our, all of our heart and all of our soul. He doesn't have our attention unless we give him our attention. That's loving God with all of our mind. And he doesn't have our abilities unless we give those to him. And that's loving God with our strength. So I want to use that as a foundation to speak with you about worship this morning. Worship being what we were created for. God created us for himself. For his pleasure, we were created. 
And whenever we take the things that God has given to us and we give them back to him, that is called worship. That's the heart of worship. So a closer look at what all of this means. The first point, and I do have points to my message. This is not a pointless message, which a lot of them are. Three things. You want to just jot those down as you see them. Worship is expressing my affection to God. Worship is expressing my affection to God. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, expressing your affection to him. Maybe you grew up in a family where there wasn't a lot of affection that went around. You didn't do a whole lot of hugging. You didn't do a whole lot of verbalizing, I love you, or things like that. Some of you didn't experience that at all growing up. Some, some of us grew up in a home where that, was, that happened profusely. My mom and dad are watching right now. I'm certain that they are. This isn't in my notes, but I can't tell you how many times my dad hugs me and just can't even get words out. He's a blubberer. (laughs) I even remember him loving me as a child by disciplining me. And yes, I got spankings back in the day. Plenty of them. And I can tell you, I never really understood how my dad could spank me and cry and say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. (laughs) And I'm thinking, when I'm a dad, I am not saying that. (laughs) How in the world? He would cry spanking me. But I'm so thankful that he took the time to love me by disciplining me. It's helped shape me and make me who I am today. My dad loves me. My mom loves me. And we, they express that to us. But maybe you grew up in a family that didn't say I love you a lot. And it's hard for you to express yourself. It's hard for you to as, as express affection to God. But listen to what Scripture says. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because he first loved us. Listen, you've got someone who loves you. You've got someone in God who loves you so much. He loved you by giving himself for you. We love because he first loved us. Hosea 6.6. 6. Throughout the, the Old Testament, we see them worshiping with sacrifices. In more than one place, God says, listen, I don't, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't need your sacrifice. What I want is you. In Hosea 6.6, 6, he says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. I don't want your sacrifices. What I want is you. What I want and what I desire is your love back to me. I don't, I don't want offerings. I want you to know me. I want to know you. What he's after is love, not religion. He's after relationship, not a religious practice. And so our first response in life, our first purpose in life, is to know God, to love him, and to worship him. And if we get that done, we've accomplished the greatest thing in life, to know God, to love him, and worship him. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the love chapter, Paul's chapter on love, three things that will last forever, Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Expressing our affection to God extravagantly. We can love because he first loved us. Romans 5, 5 says that God's love has been poured out into our hearts through his Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. And in Romans 5, 8, it says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. A lot of religions in the world, their God is angry and needs to be appeased or you want to avoid him or be afraid of him. But this is not the God of our Bible. He doesn't need to be appeased. He just wants our response of love. He loves us so much and he wants to be loved. He wants to hear that from us I think we need to keep in mind and be reminded that knowing and loving God are the most important things that we can do. The most important things that we can do. It doesn't matter. 
I'm going to tell you right now, some of you in the room need to hear this. It doesn't matter what you get done today. Some of you are all about the checklist and the to-do list. You can knock out your entire to-do list. You can accomplish great things. You can achieve great goals. But if we don't know God a little bit better and we don't love him a little bit more, then I'm just going to say this. The day was wasted. Your existence isn't checking off things on a to-do list to get your, your things accomplished. Our life is for him. Our life isn't for ourselves. I have a plan. I have a will. And sometimes a little stubborn about that. But what I want, like Jesus said in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. We aren't put on this earth to check things off a to-do list. We were made to know God and to love him back. We were made to worship him. And so that might not sound easy to uh, someone who's not naturally an expressive person, but you can express your affection to to God anytime by just saying thank you. Just say thank you. How many of you have done something for someone else, not expecting or needing to hear it, but when you get a, you go out of your way to say thanks? We hosted five uh, caucuses here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago here in our church facilities. Guess how many thank you notes I got this week? Five. From each of the caucus captains said, thank you so much. We appreciate you opening your facilities and letting us do our, do our business. And I'm thinking, they didn't have to do that. I don't even remember their, I mean, we just had short interaction, and, but they send a, a thank you note. It's so, so nice. Just... Just a simple thank you goes a long, long ways. Some of you might think the only way that we worship God is by singing, and singing is a great way to worship God, and we do that here. But there's so many other ways for us to worship God, and that's why we've titled this series More Than a Song. Probably the greatest way for us to express our affection to God is by simply giving our lives to Him. Giving our lives. And I think about that, I'm thinking about a wedding where the bride and the groom, they recite vows to each other. And those vows might be kind of traditional. It seems like we get a little bit more uh, contemporary type vows and the bride and the groom are sharing their thoughts with each other. But it will almost always say something like this. And if it doesn't say, then I'm going to ask them to put it in there. Because really what this is all about is saying, I'm giving my life to you. And it's the other person saying, listen, I'm giving my life to you. I'm committing myself to you. Why? Because that's the heart of love. It says, you matter more to me than I matter to me. The way that we worship God is saying, God, you matter more to me than I matter to myself. The way you as a husband express love to your wife is you say, you matter more to me than, than I do. And I put you before I put myself. Can you imagine the worship to our God when we say, listen, this is what I want to do, but I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to set aside my plans, I'm going to set aside my will, and I'm going to choose your will. Nothing greater, I think, than God... Can, can hear or sense or feel than you giving your life to him. The greatest way that you can express your affection is saying, I'm giving you my life. I'm gonna give you opportunity this morning if, if you're not living for Jesus to offer your life to him at the end of this message and I'm starting to wind it down. What's holding us back from giving our lives to him, completely to him? I think mostly it's fear. People get afraid, afraid of not being in control. You all are a bunch of control freaks. How many of you admit that? Okay, you like to be in control. How many of you are good at sitting in the passenger seat? Some of you can't do that. Like you drive all the time. You don't let your spouse drive because all you're going to do is this the whole time. 
One, because you're not in control and you, you just can't handle it. We, we love having control, and I'm, you may not be a control freak, but listen, when things are out of your control, when you're not making the decisions and the choices, and you're, you're in the hands of somebody else who's deciding those things, that's not comfortable. It's not comfortable when somebody else is, has the control. So fear of losing control, the feel of, I don't know, feeling of fear of being embarrassed or humiliated, you can fill in the blank. Listen, fear is a tool of the enemy to keep you from doing the right thing. The right thing, the best thing, what you were created for is to offer your life back to him, back to the one who gave his life for you, who died in your place, who demonstrated his love by going to the cross for you. But when you take a step of faith past that fear, then we find God is so loving, so accepting, so forgiving, and so worthy of being trusted of every part of our lives. This morning, I encourage you to step past that fear and express your affection to the Lord. Not only is worship expressing my affection, but it's focusing my attention. Let me just say this. This thought came to me. My wife is on a cruise this, this week. I wasn't planning to tell you that, but it's true. Warmer weather, and uh, I stayed home. But I've been on enough of those that uh, I've, I've noticed that this is what happens, talking about control. If you've ever been on a cruise, maybe you've seen this happen as you're coming into a port. Uh, there's a little tiny, little tiny boat. A lot of times it says pilot on the side of it, and it'll come right up beside the, the big cruise ship, and that pilot gets off of the ship. Guess what his purpose is? To drive the big ship. The captain of the ship gives control to some other person to to navigate the ship into the port. Because there's nobody that knows to navigate that canal like the guy who lives there and does this all the time. And so the pilot of that little boat will come onto the cruise ship, take control, and guide that into the port. That's us giving control to God. Say, God, you... You know things better than I do. Why wouldn't I let you be in charge? Why wouldn't I let you navigate? Why wouldn't I let you direct my steps? Why wouldn't I let you decide my future? Why wouldn't I just give myself to you and say, hey, you drive. I don't know where I'm going. Expressing our affection to God. Giving him our attention, number two. Focusing my attention. You must love the Lord your God with all of your mind. Focusing our attention on him. We're self-centered by nature. Not only are we control freaks, but we're self-centered. And we live in a self-centered society. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and to peace. We need to focus our attention on God. Focusing on ourself is the opposite of focusing on God. If you're absorbed in yourself, there's no way that you can focus on God. You're ignoring him if you're focused on yourself. Back in uh, verse 2 of Romans chapter 8, it says, Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Again, it's about giving God control of our mind, our strength, our thoughts, our attention. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Don't conform to the pattern of this world. In the New Living Translation, he says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. That's our mind. Changing the way that you think, the renewing of your mind. The message version says it like this. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. That you fit into the culture around you without thinking. Listen, I, I know this. It's a whole lot easier for us to fit into the culture around us than to not. 
And we may or may not realize it, but we're adapting all the time. Think of the things that over the last 20, 30, 40 years, we've learned to accept as everyday stuff. 40 years ago, we would have lost our minds thinking about some of the things that our culture and our world accepts. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. He wants our attention, and when we give him our attention, when we fix our attention on him, that's when we transform. That's when we're changed. That's when we become new from the inside out. We fix our attention on him through daily time with him. And listen, I know that this often gets stated in, in messages or teaching that you need to take the very, first, the very first time of your day and give it to God. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, but I'm saying some of you, every time you hear that, you know, I don't get up in the morning very well. I have every intention of getting up at four o'clock in the morning and spending two hours with God, but when the alarm's going off at seven and I'm still snoozing, I've already lost. Here's what I want to tell you today. That hopefully this is a little bit freeing. If the morning time doesn't work for you, do it another time. Just do it. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the afternoon. It doesn't matter if it's the last thing of your day. If you're carving out time to be with God, how can that be wrong? If you're carving out time in your life and your daily schedule to focus your attention on him, it's a good thing. It's only a good thing. Take the time. Stop everything else. Talk to him. Read his word. Matthew 6, 6 says that when you pray, Jesus is saying this, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. What he's saying is, get all the distractions out so that you can focus your attention on him. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. The focus is on God, not on yourself. Focus your attention on him through constant conversation. Constant conversation. How many of you talk to God all the time? Some of you are going... How, how do you do that? How am I going to have other conversations if all I'm doing is talking with God? I think we've got to think differently because conversations with God are not me talking to him all the time. Conversations with God is we're always on the, on the line. You remember back in the days when phones hung on the wall? And remember the, the time period in your life when you were dating and you were talking on the phone and you took the phone for the whole family, but you're talking on the phone at night, and you might go 20 minutes without even saying anything, but just knowing that they're on the other end of the phone, there's just something. It's like we're on the phone together. We haven't said anything for 20 minutes, but we're talking on the phone. Some of you are laughing, but it's true. You remember those times, Okay. Now, now they're FaceTiming, and, you know, I can tell you one of my daughters walking around our house, you know, enthralled with a boy, and she's got him on FaceTime, and just walking through the house, and I'm thinking, is that just a picture on your phone? Because I haven't heard you say anything for like five minutes, <laughs> you know, and then she puts the phone in my face and says, say hi to my dad, <laughs> like, uh, it's a different world, guys. I remember watching the Jetsons and they were like talking to people like on a device that looked like this and they were like looking at and they were talking to people. We do that now. I have no idea how I got off on that. <laughs> By having an ongoing conversation with God, listen, just listen. The best part of conversation is you listening. The best part of a conversation is you demonstrating to the other person that you're giving them your attention and you are listening to them. So we focus on God through a constant conversation. First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. It's hard for us to understand that, but if we just think, you know, God's on the other line and we don't hang up, we're, we're online all the time. I remember back in the days when we had to dial up internet we would dial up and go through all that stuff and get on and 
and then hurry to get off because it used our phone line and somebody needed to call their boyfriend or girlfriend and that would have been a problem. But when, when internet happened and we were just on all the time, it was like a revelation to me. That's, that's how God wants to be with us. We're just always online. Not that activity is always going on, but we're always online and when he wants to say something to us, we, we're, we're online to hear him. Pray without ceasing. Pray continually. Pray all the time. Never stop praying. Not only is worship expressing our affection to God and focusing our attention, but it's using our abilities for God. This is my last point, and I need to wrap it up. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul, all of your mind, and last, all of your strength. Colossians 3.23, I'm not sure that it's on the screen, but you will write this down and and make this the, the, the verse for this point. Where Paul says, whatever you do, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. If we could truly understand and implement this verse, it would revolutionize our lives. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Give it everything that you have as if in everything or anything that you do, you're doing it for the Lord, not for, not for, not for people. So you don't really like your boss. You don't really like your supervisor. You're like this. Listen, change your perspective. I know I'm working for that person, but I'm doing this not for them. I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this because I'm honoring God with my abilities. Whatever you do means anything. It means everything as though you were working for the Lord and not people. We don't need to spend five days, five hours a day alone with God. We don't have to come to church every day of the week. And don't get me wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what if instead of always feeling like we need to do more, we simply changed our perspective of who it is that we're working for, of who it is that we do what we do for. And then everything that we do when it's for the Lord becomes worship to him. Pastor Luke shared a a few weeks ago that oftentimes we think of our life like a pie and we've got all these pieces of the pie like our career or our social life or our marriage or our hobbies, our recreation, whatever those things might be. We've got ourselves compartmentalized. But God wants everything. He wants the the whole pie, the whole thing of our lives, not just a part He wants to be at the center, a part of everything. It's not what we do, it's who we do it for that matters. Whatever you do, do it for God. Whether you're a bus driver or an attorney or a nurse or an accountant or a teacher, a manager, a plumber, a carpenter, an electrician, a police officer, a salesperson, a receptionist, Whatever you do, if you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, do it all for Jesus. Listen, worship to the Lord is so much more than a song. It's expressing our affections to Him, all of our heart and our soul. It's focusing our attention on Him with all of our mind. And it's using our abilities for His purpose and for His plan with all of our strength. Everyone worships something. Everyone worships something for someone. God wired us that way. It's in our DNA. You can go to any culture in the world and I guarantee you, you're going to find them worshiping something or someone. Acts chapter 17, Paul was in Athens and he addresses the council there and he says this, men of Athens, I noticed that you are very religious in every way. And he noticed all of their, all of their memorials, their shrines, the altars that uh, were set up. And he said, I noticed that there was one with an inscription on it to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one that I'm telling you about. He made the world and everything in it. He goes on to say, in him we live and move and have our being. That is the God I'm telling you about. Listen, if we don't worship God, We're going to worship something else because that's what we were made to do. 
So my question to you as, we, as, we, as I conclude this is, what are, what are you worshiping? What are you worshiping or who are you worshiping? You're sitting in church, you're going, oh, it's obvious. I worship Jesus. Do you? Do you? Did you worship him this morning when you came in? And you said, and you're thinking, hey, you said it's more than a song. I'm not a singer. But I just want you from the very bottom of your heart, answer the question, what are you worshiping? What has the primary share of your affection? What has the primary share of your attention? What do you give the primary share of your abilities to? That is worship. The biggest temptation in life, I believe, is always going to be worshiping something or someone other than God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? just understand how much God loves us and how much he cares about every detail of our lives. We couldn't help but love him back and offer our lives to him in worship. Father, this morning, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. If we've wandered off course, God, I pray that you would get our attention we give you our attention this morning. Say, God, speak to me. I need to hear you. We want to give you our affection because of all that you've done for us. We give our lives to you and say, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. What can I do for you? And we to offer our lives, our abilities to you, Jesus. So, God, would you speak to us? this time this morning have your way in our lives would you stand with me I want us to close just the, these last few minutes they're going to lead us in a song or, or two short choruses that just really focus our attention on him and then I'm going to come back and pray for you